no uh, biological or radiological screening test been approved or officially tested for head and neck cancer in general. So I'm going to talk about something much more useful, much more uh, important in screening and managing uh, those patients. I know also that most of the attendee will be part either for primary care program or primary care physicians. So I mean, mainly my focus will be uh, on this group of uh, attendee. So it's very important and common clinical problems that can affect all age group. You will see pediatric patient, you new need, 50 years old, 100 years old. Any patient come, can come and walk to your clinic with a neck mass or some sort of head and neck cancer at some point of your practice and your career. It's very complex differential diagnosis unless you have a very good set of mind in dealing with those patients. You're going to spend a lot of time and a lot of money just looking around to know exactly what's going with him. Early diagnosis make a whole difference in those patients. And believe me, from my practice, one of major issues with those patients is delayed diagnosis, not the presentation itself. Treatment complication is common, and this is where major role of primary care physician and other supportive services will come mainly in controlling those patient uh, quality uh, of life. Now, common presentation for those patients, any patient with neck, head and neck cancer could present with any of these complaints. Hoarseness, usual indication of early glottic cancer, early glottic tumor, not necessarily malignant, sometimes benign, but at least it indicates the source of that problem could be the larynx. You not a nasal blockage, although simple in children, most of the time due to infection or adenoid, it could be due to rhabdomyosarcoma and the nasal cavity, could be an adult nasopharyngeal carcinoma or same nasal tumor. So the simple symptoms can indicate for you what's the source of that problem. Ear pain with normal ear exam. This is one of the commonest presentation for patients with head and neck cancer, mostly because of referred pain from base of tongue or nasopharynx oral cavity tumor. Uh, epistaxis, again, it's something that very common in clinical practice, so unless you dig deep on it to know exactly when it was started, you will probably get a missed sinonasal tumor or nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which is a classical presentation uh, for those patients. Nick mass per se, it's something that needs to be investigated and need to be addressed at all levels. Non-healing ulcer does not indicate that this patient have aphthous ulceration or have some kind of mechanical ulceration in the oral cavity, no matter how small it is, if it's persists more than two weeks, this is something very serious and has to be investigated thoroughly. Could be autoimmune, yes, but most likely it's malignant tumor that need to be addressed and biopsied. And again, I've seen so many patients being treated for a long time with oral ulceration, with antibiotic or with antifungal, and all what they need, not as, uh, advanced screening test, a just simple biopsy from that area or referring to somebody who will biopsy it uh, simply. So a clinical examination of those patients, it's a beautiful and very accurate uh, screening test for them. Facial weakness and numbness. Now, facial weakness, why I'm presenting, presenting here? Because, again, from my experience, I had a lot of referred patients with parotid carcinoma who had facial paralysis who have been treated as patients with Bell's palsy. Although their clinical presentation was very classical for parotid carcinoma, Genoma and parotid tumor or skull based tumor. Bill's body, just to know, it has to be idiopathic, it has to affect all the facial branches, and most of the patients have to recover spontaneously. If the patient does not recover, if it's only certain branches of the facial nerve get affected, if the patient have lymph node, if the patient have ear problem, if the patient have parotid mass, that's an indication of something much more serious than simple autoimmune or self limiting Bill's palsy. So the patient has to be fully investigated. Same thing for numbness, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, invading the skull base, affecting the cranial nerves. One of their classical presentation, it's unusually progressive numbness of the face. So that has to be addressed and has to be also uh, uh, investigated. Dysphagia, odinophagia, I don't have to go in detail with this. This is a classical presentation for all or, or digestive tract uh, tumor. Diplopia may indicate an oral cavity or, or uh, sorry, say nasal cavity or nasopharyngeal carcinoma or even orbital uh, carcinoma. Patient with pain in their denture and poorly fitting denture. That's another thing, please. If the patient comes to you complaining with that, look under his denture. This is a very common presentation of oral cavity cancer in elderly with oral denture. 
don't assume that this is because of mechanical pressure. Majority of those patients end up having cancer. Yes, it can be pressure, but don't assume it without making sure 100% that this is uh, the cause. Now, diagnosis, the first step always, it's how serious is the situation. And that mainly, mainly depending on the presentation of the patient. So we're going to go back and forth for the area of the history that always indicating what you are dealing with. Now, sometimes kids coming to you with a small lymph node in the neck that does not indicate anything. I don't have to go full detail with those patients, but CT scan, ultrasound, MRI, and I've seen that's done a lot, unfortunately, for those patients, or even FNA and biopsies for something that clinically and hist from history, it looks clearly like just a reactive simple uh, lymph node. So assessing the patient situation or serious of serious of situation, it's a very important uh, step. Always be simple. Don't complicate yourself. Don't complicate the patient. Doing MRI for something that you can diagnose with ultrasound, it's waste of everything. Okay? And probably you will not be able even to read it. Doing a CT scan for something that you can feel it by your hand does not add much to you. So be simple in your investigation and you're thinking about uh, the patient. And keep in your mind, common is common. Don't assume rare tumor in somebody who's having clearly uh, infected, for example, lymph node. But again, keep your mind open all the time. Now, again, history, by far, it's the most important screening tool in those patients. That will be physical examination. You have to do it. And when I say physical examination, I'm insisting that head and neck examination is not complete without doing nasopharynx by simple fibrotic examination to the nasopharynx. You cannot say that enough exam, no cavity, seeing the tonsil, look under the tongue, look at the base of the tongue if you can look at that, see the soft palate, see the upper alveolar ridge, all these area that you can visualize in few seconds does not need much, but you need to see it. Without seeing it, you cannot say that I completed the neck and the hidden examination is, is negative. FNA comes always next and all other investigations come least in these patients. So it's really how we deal with the patient when they come to our clinic with any kind of neck masses or neck uh, or hidden neck complete. Now, just I'll give you two examples of two important factors that if you really highlight them, you're going to get most of your diagnosis correctly. By, by those patients. So simply knowing the age of the patient will just classify them immediately for you in which area you're gonna uh, go. Now, developmental time of these masses for But this is not the norm. The norm that those patients usually come with a short uh, history. So knowing the age and knowing the time development for that, that tumor, that mass, or that ulcer will guide you through the rest of the uh, process that you need uh, to do. Now, investigation, radiology is all of them available. We have ultrasound, CT scan, MRI, and is the gold standard for thyroid. Everybody know that. But again, CT scan is the gold standard for evaluating the neck for any lymphadenopathy and any neck masses. 
uh, MRI, always supplemental and come third. Nuclear medicine, always the last. Don't waste your time with bit scanning those patients and don't waste your time with radioactive iodine or technetium uh, scanning. Tissue diagnosis, if the ulcer is not in the oral cavity or superficially inaccessible and you can biopsy directly, FNA, FNA, FNA is the gold standard. Anything else is, comes always down. What I see is, is, is completely different than this. Most of those patients get sent to uh, open biopsy. And just to understand what's the effect of a biopsy, open biopsy in patient with nasopharyngeal carcinoma decreased their survival by 20%. Simply because it's altering the neck vascularity, it's changing the staging of the end staging from N1 to NX, so we don't know exactly how much spillage of the tumor in the neck. So that does really affect those patients majorly. Do FNA first, believe me, 80% to 90% of those patients you will get your diagnosis by just simply doing FNA. Now, empirical antibiotic, this is a very common practice done by a lot of people. And I'm not saying completely wrong, but most of the time it's wrong. The reason why, because unless you're really suspecting an inflammatory process, antibiotic will not treat tumors. Believe me, keep this message very clear. Don't give antibiotic if you are not 100% or at least 80% suspecting that this is an infectious process. Patient with four weeks, five weeks history of neck mass, this is not an inflammatory process. Patient with two days, three days of neck mass, yes, I agree, this is most likely an infectious process. You could give him antibiotic. Other thing, no more than two weeks. There is no point of giving them for six months, seven months. I've seen patient received more than 12 courses of antibiotic for lymphoma over one year period. Every month he was given two weeks of antibiotic. So this is this is absolutely ridiculous to be honest with you. Patient who does not respond to the first course of antibiotic, don't waste your time. Don't give him another course of antibiotic. Always go to the next step. Other thing, and I've seen it quite frequently, patient given antibiotic and given follow up after three or four months. And that's not right. If you are suspecting possibility that this is, may not be a simple infection that's happening to everybody, this patient needs to be evaluated after two to three weeks. Three, four months, you're probably going to magn magnify this patient's staging, and from T1 or N1 or whatever staging he is, he's going to come to you with metastasis or very advanced disease. So follow-up immediately after finishing the antibiotic is a clue for further uh, testing if the patient needs any further testing. Now, when we don't have to be uh, worried, any kids with a small uh, cervical lymph node, you don't have to worry about them, especially if they have no other symptoms. They are thriving well, there's no weight loss, their feeding are good, and they're sleeping well, there's no fever, there's no hepatosplenomegaly. Don't make the family anxious about simple lymph nodes in pediatric patients. Posterior lymph nodes in adults, extremely common, extremely common, and does not need a FNA, does not need a seed scan, does not need biopsies. This is, should not be worried, worrying you if it's small and not progressively increasing in size. Less than one centimeter thyroid nodule, and this is a very clear recommendation, unless you have a cervical metastasis and you're looking for the source, less than one centimeter thyroid nodule, don't further investigating them with other than ultrasound sound annual or every six months after sound. Just leave them alone. They will not do any harm for them. Now, common treatment for head and neck cancer, basically surgery is the mainstay for all thyroid cancer or ancillary gland uh, tumors. Radiotherapy, usually for nasopharyngeal carcinoma and uh, early stage glottic cancer. Chemotherapy, always in combination with other modality uh, el, el, for treatment as a primary treatment, alone usually given only for palliative patients, and multimodality mostly given for advanced cancer uh, of head and neck. Unfortunately, most of our patients falling within this group. Follow up, we always follow up those patients for cancer uh, surveillance and for uh, complication uh, surveillance. Cancer surveillance, uh, usually based on complete history and physical examination. Again, we go back to the same principle. Weight loss is an indication for something come serious or probably a complication. Newly onset pain 
after resolving of the patient pain, something need to be investigated and need to be looked at deeply. Progressive dysphagia in a patient who is cured from his tumor or has other cancer, it's something also alarming for those patients. Masses in the neck, in the mouth, in other parts of the body, in those patients, need also to be further uh, investigated. In a newly developing ulcer in the oral cavity or the nasal, nasal cavity or say nasal area, it needs to be investigated and uh, biopsied. Now, mostly of the can or most of the cancer surveillance will be done by the primary team, either the head and neck surgical oncologist, the radiation oncologist, or the oncologist, or the radiologist if we are dealing with thyroid cancer. And most of what we are doing, basically, is just looking for recurrence. Now, recurrence, we always love to have biomarkers for recurrence. Unfortunately, in head and neck cancer, there is no biomarkers except for thyroid. And the thyroid have very specific set to deal with. It's not every thyroid cancer. You have to screen them and you have to keep following them and you have to look for recurrence. Most of the thyroid cancer patients are well differentiated thyroid carcinoma patient. A low risk patient does not need further treatment or further follow up. However, thyroglobulin mainly limited for well differentiated thyroid carcinoma, high risk patient, and stimulated thyroglobulin, that means that TSH should be very high, is the most reliable thyroglobulin level indicating possibility of recurrence or possibility of remnant of the disease. Epstein-Barr virus titer is something that used before for nasopharyngeal carcinoma. It was tested for possible uh, diagnosis, zero outcome. They couldn't really get anything from it. Then now they are doing it for possible a screening for recurrence. Unfortunately, there is no standard on it, still very debatable, still the outcome is not clear, so it's not recommended at all to do it at this stage. Maybe in the coming few years, we don't know. Now, radiology, do I have to do radiology when they come to my clinic five years after their treatment, which is the usual uh, I will see the patient with? No. Most of the time, they don't need any further investigation, except that you're probably going to have to do CT scan just every now and then, i.e. every one year or so, because any head and neck cancer patient, mostly related to smoking, mostly related to smoking, and those patients are at higher risk of developing lung cancer at some point of their uh, age. Bit scan, it's not indicated for any screening after five years. Liver function test, although being done, be recommended, but there is no clear evidence that this is, will alter the patient outcome or will improve the patient uh, follow-up. Look for second primary. Most of those patient does not develop yet. 10% uh, down the road will develop a second primary. Most commonly, most commonly, lung cancer. So the lung has to be investigated very clearly. Now, some of the, can three, the cancer that develop in the long term is treatment related. We're talking about radioactive iodine inducing uh, leukemia or lymphoma. We're talking about external beam radiotherapy inducing sarcoma of the head and neck. We're talking about chemotherapy that inducing all kinds of cancer uh, in the rest of the body. But these are need to be looked at it long-term uh, follow-up of those patients. And believe me, those, those are the things that you're going to look at it when, you come, when they come to your uh, clinic. Complication surveillance, we have common complications, we have rare complications. I'm not going to talk about rare complications because these are usually very aggressive and the patient needs to be treated in a very specialized center. But common complication, it's quite a, a long list. Pain, mouth dryness, hypothyroidism, dental complication, voice change, peripheral neuropathy, hearing loss. All these are complications of treatment that you're going to see in your clinic at some point of their uh, follow-up. Now, pain, it's extremely common. 30% of the patient will develop chronic pain after they commence their treatment. 23% of them, they feel that their pain after treatment is worse than their pain before treatment. And this is, by the way, this is the study that we have done here. So this is our patient. I'm not talking about outside study. Now, affecting their daily life, Yes, it affects their daily life. 26% of the pain is associated with the pleasure of talking and pleasure of eating. So the two entity of life that really those people can enjoy, it's really get affected by the pain. So addressing these areas, addressing that pain, it's a long-term kind of treatment. And you're going to see them complaining of this kind of problem all the time, even after they discharge from their cancer uh, treatment uh, area. Now, this is just to show you one of one of the good studies actually about pain. 
forget about all these. Just look at this uh, graph down here. This is time one, where the pain scoring is quite a, a, a high, uh, or satisfaction with the, with pain control is quite sorry, quite low. The pain is quite high in those patients at the start of the treatment. At the end of their treatment, despite the complication of the treatment, patient psychologically is happy. So they score quite well in terms of quality of life and pain control because they are happy that they finished their treatment, not because the pain disappeared. Three months after the treatment, they will go back to their baseline of pain. So the pain is real and it's long term and it's need to be addressed and need to be addressed with every single clinic visit of those uh, patients. Uh, dysphagia, mainly due to radiation, chemo radiation because of dryness and because of physiological effect and alteration of mucosa, alteration of uh, muscular uh, anatomy of the uh, oropharynx, oral cavity and pharynx. Uh, surgery can alter also these uh, muscle movements. Treatment most of the time need a collaboration with speech pathology and swallowing therapy and they improve. Believe me, I've seen patients who cannot swallow anything with proper treatment they improve. So don't hesitate to send them to somebody who can really help them with this. Mouth dryness, it's extremely common in those patients. Almost every single patient receive radiation to the head and neck will end up with mouth dryness. And the aim of treatment of uh, mouth dryness, with the, uh, the xerostomia, is to increase existence uh, of flow of saliva, mainly by bilocarbon or putting some gel in the mouth, uh, control uh, the state of oral health by advising the patient for frequent mouth brushing, for using baby uh, uh, toothpaste, by the way, not the regular toothpaste because they cannot tolerate its burning, uh, control uh, the dental caries, which is extremely common in those patients, and almost every single patient will lose, more, will lose most of his teeth about 10 years after the treatment, unless they take very, very good care uh, of this teeth. Treatment of possible infection, most commonly candida, uh, it is, is, has to be done every now and then. So you have to look inside their oral cavity, make sure that they don't have uh, these things. Now, this is just a picture for one of our patients. This is how the mouth dry, it's dry like a paper. There's nothing, there's no saliva at all in the mouth of those patients. And this is just a few months after radiation and chemo radiation, you see how much dental uh, dissolving and how much uh, uh, gingival uh, infection, gingival reaction he will have uh, throughout the road. Uh, other complications, hypothyroidism, it's affect more than 50% of head and neck cancer patient. And sometimes it can be uh, discovered a few months to couple of years after treatment, but good number of those patients will develop the hypothyroidism three or four or five years after. So any hedonic cancer patient has to be screened every uh, six months to one year at least with thyroid function uh, test. Uh, special consideration should be done for thyroid cancer, and I'm not going to go in detail on this as Dr. Al-Khayal will uh, talk about it, I think, uh, later on, inshallah ta'ala, today. Uh, voice change is quite common. Need, patient need to be reassured about these uh, changes. Peripheral neuropathy, it's a very common complication from chemotherapy. We should not really uh, overlook this as those patients, most of them elderly patients, most of them have peripheral, neurop peripheral uh, vascular uh, uh, insufficiency. Most of them are diabetic patient. With the add on of peripheral neuropathy, they are at higher risk of developing uh, peripheral injury to their legs and their feet and their toes. So that has to be addressed by different kind uh, of care. Hearing loss is something quite common in those patients, simply because radiation will affect the cochlea. Chemotherapy, especially since platinum, will affect the cochlea. 88% of patients who receive chemo radiation and the chemo that including cis platinum will develop hearing loss. Now, how bad it is, it's different from patient to patient. Some patients will have simple conductive hearing loss simply because their mucosa in the ear is not healthy, it's not producing normal uh, secretions. So he needs a simple tube in the clinic can be done and the patient will start hearing quite well after that. But those with sensory neural hearing loss, they need further treatment, they need either a hearing aid, which will help them really in their daily, day by day uh, life, or they probably need cochlear implant at some point, which is quite advanced procedure. But believe it or not, those patients, they cannot swallow most of them. 
they cannot eat well, their mouth is dry, they cannot talk well, their vision gets affected most of the time by the radiation to the head and neck cancer or by their age, and added to that, they cannot hear, you basically just isolate them from the world. So addressing this, this issue, it's quite very important in those patients, and they have to be screened at least annually for uh, the hearing loss. Prevention or decreasing burden of disease is something that we have to address. This is only, uh, this is the slide before the last one. I'm not gonna spend time on it. Smoking, I don't have to say more about cessation of smoking. Uh, you see that it's associated with not only the head and neck or lung cancer, it's basically associated with everything. Even bladder cancer carry high risk of uh, association or associated clearly with uh, smoking. Alcohol, although it's not common here, yet it's something need to be addressed. And you would be surprised that a good number of patients with oral cavity cancer do have some exposure to alcohol. Now, beside alcohol, I didn't put it here, I forgot to put it here, is some use of herbal uh, material, especially what you call it shemma here. It's quite very common, especially in the southern region of the kingdom. It's very potent carcinogenic. Most of our oral cavity cancer, Yujun, many Minjezan or Manadak Hadi, those patients need to be counseled very, very clearly and in detail about cessation of these habits. And unless they stop it, they will develop cancer. If they have cancer, they will develop another cancer, even if they get cured. So that's something you need to be addressed with the patient. Radiation exposure per se, especially worker who's working in, in nuclear medicine or something like that, they, may, they are at high risk of developing thyroid cancer. Uh, treat precancerous lesion, liquid lake in the oral cavity, in the lip, some skin changes need to be uh, addressed. HPV vaccination, you're probably gonna hear about it a lot in, in, in the coming few years about preventing cervical uh, carcinoma. In the head and neck cancer, there is a very good promising data from the West. Unfortunately, that we did a study looking for HPV prevalence in our head and neck cancer patient, it's 0%. So I don't think that HPV vaccination will alter our uh, head and neck cancer rate in terms of squamous cell carcinoma. So we should look at it later on. ABV vaccination, Nobody's talking about it, being tried before, mainly in China, to, be, to decrease the risk of nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which is almost 100% associated with EBV. Again, there is nothing in the market right now. Something will come in the future. I don't know. We go back to the baseline. Early diagnosis will mean better uh, outcome. So in conclusion, listen to your patient. Give him your ears, please. Listen what he see. This is the key point to uh, help him. Examine him properly or examine her properly. Just simply looking at the patient, it's not enough. Uh, be a proactive physician. Look for risks, for look for complication. Look for something that you can prevent. Even if you've developed something now, just prevent thing that from getting worse. And remember, you don't have to be uh, in a tertiary care setting to make your patient safe and comfortable. You can do it from any place, even in a primary care clinic, somewhere in uh, Hafar, somewhere in anywhere in the world. You could just give the patient Panadol or something that can help them, paracetamol can help them with pain. That will make a huge difference uh, in their life. You could ask him just to drink water when they talk because their mouth is very dry and you will feel, you will feel, you will see uh, quite a huge uh, impact of that. Just giving them a hearing aid or advise them to go for a hearing aid will make a difference in their life. So something very simple you could do, it can help those patients majorly. Uh, and I will conclude with this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh,